to join us today. Uh, Isabel and Julia are from uh, Johns Hopkins, and they are from a uh, research uh, center, the Baker Memory Laboratory. And you all have some really pioneering research that you're doing on a lot of different topics and levels of memory care. And I thought that it would be a great opportunity to help you spread the word because it's not easy getting participants to some of these uh, studies, correct? Right, right. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Steve, for having us today. We're very, very grateful to be able to be speaking to you um, and to hear Ms. Perkins later on today. Um, and just to be able to speak to the positive aging community in general. So like Steve mentioned, uh, my name is Isabel, and this uh, woman right here is Julia. We're both research coordinators at the Johns Hopkins uh, Division of Psychiatric Neuroimaging. Um, so we're in charge of recruiting for a lot of different studies that Julia will tell you more about. Yeah, so all of our studies have to do with aging and dementia, and specifically we're recruiting either people who have dementia or Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment. And mild cognitive impairment is normally the first memory problems that happen before things get worse, and that is the hardest population for us to recruit for. But if anyone's interested in participating, it'd be great. You would expect as a participant to be compensated for your time. We pay for parking at the hospital if you drive. And the first visit is paper pencil memory tests. You'll have an MRI and there's normally a two year follow up. So if any of that sounds interesting, please reach out to us. <laughs> I love it. And I dropped in the link to the website, your email, the phone number. And then, um, you know, obviously folks know we we get we seem to get people from all over the country now and uh but we are our main uh audience is from the mid-atlantic where going to johns hopkins in baltimore would be convenient um uh are there some of these studies and is it worth it for folks to reach out to you even if they might be in a, a bit further away uh, to be a part of these studies and the resources that you have? Yeah, of course. It depends how far, like if you're a state or way or so, I would say definitely as long as you're willing to travel for one. Further than that, none of our studies are remote, but there are st other studies at Johns Hopkins through the ADRC, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and some of those might be remote. So if it's something where you're interested, you can still reach out to us and we'll pass on your information and they might be able to find something for you. Just we currently don't have that in our division. Got it. And uh, yeah, I mean, Hopkins is one of those institutions where you all are thought leaders and pioneers in this space. So, you know, no matter where you are, it's a great place to start if somebody's out there and they're 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 looking for resources or research or studies. Reach out to uh, Julia and Isabel, and hopefully through all your connections, if somebody's not appropriate, you can send them in the right way. Um, great. Well, again, thanks so much for for joining us, and uh, we uh, we will be in touch. And I've. I've thrown out the, uh, just for folks in the audience, I've cast the, the net because there's so many experts over there at, at Hopkins. Hopefully we can have uh, some of the doctors and researchers on one of our discussions here in the future, talking about some of the innovative topics you, you all are experts in. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much again, Steve, for your time and uh, for this space. Thanks you for bet. having me. <laughs> okay, you bet. Okay, so... Um, with that, uh, I am really excited about our speaker today. Um, if I've had her on before, she is back by popular demand because I tell you at the first time we had her on, I was just blown away, but then I got a bunch of emails from people that attended that session that were blown away. But uh, Tracy Cram Perkins uh, wrote this book, Dementia Home Care. And, uh, but as you can see on the screen, one of the things that I think that, uh, that she is just in a class by herself are these creative uh, tips and hacks and, and just 
identifying resources that are that you can get at a hardware store or office supply store that can help you be a better caregiver. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome Tracy to the stage. And um, Tracy already knows that I'm the the captain of her fan club, um, and uh, I I'm I'm so charged up to have you back. And and uh, uh, but Tracy, for those that weren't on the first discussion that we had with you, which I am going to drop into chat here, um, share with us a little bit about your background and uh, what led you to the current position that you're currently in. Well. I have cared for four family members. I took care of my mom, my dad, my uncle, and my aunt in that order. Uh, everyone had different types of dementia, and every single person also had additional health issues. Two of them, I, were take, I was taking care of my dad and my uncle at the same time, but my dad lived with me, my uncle lived on his own. And so it was trying to learn how to navigate all of the different uh, care styles, caregiving, and then personalities. Um, so it really took me a while to figure things out, and I will be blunt. I failed 75% of the time. Everything you're going to see is the 25% where we did well. So I just want to make sure that you know that, that I fell on my face enough times my face is flat just like your computer screen or TV. So <laughs> oh, it, it, you all know that it's a very, very difficult journey. And, and I want to share with you one quick tip before we get started. My very favorite, my dad used to work uh, in his shop after hours in his uh, doing projects. Okay. So I bought a apron. And the apron also helps with messiness issues when you're eating. So what I ended up doing is this looks just like the apron that he had. So oh I got a bunch of these and we would sit around the table. And it, when he was concerned about having a problem, he didn't, I didn't want him to think he was a baby or a child. So we all had activities we did right before we ate. We put on our aprons and then we sat down to eat. And then all of us took off our aprons so I could wash the aprons. And then there was less mess on him and he didn't feel like he was being singled out. So it was just a quick tip to, and, and I also put stuff in the pockets so that he could have something to play with or fidget with. So, you know, it just, I, just anything you can do, simple, simple things you can do to make it easier to take care of somebody. Um, that's what I'm all about. Oh my God. What a brilliant, I, this is why I, <laughs> why I love you. I mean, it's think about like, think about it folks is, is that we, we, put these little baby apron or it looks like you're at a crab feast apron on our elders because they've been, you know, spilling or what have you. And it's just um, not dignified. And, and I, what a brilliant suggestion is, is that's a shop apron that mm -hmm. we all, when we're working in our shop on woodworking and stuff, it just makes such, such sense. So um, before you jump in, I just got to give a huge shout out because I don't think a week goes by that I don't share. And I, I, I gave you all this, a recording from the last session uh, in, in the link there. But the, the brilliant tip that um, Tracy shares in that recording is the, uh, she had a hard time getting her loved one to change uh, his clothes and so they began wrapping his uh, clothes for the next day, like they were giving a present to one of their family members and they'd wrap it up and they'd put a, a letter in there and, and make a big deal about it. And it was this fun activity. And then the next day he wakes up and he's got this present that he opens up and he's got his clean clothes and she said, hey, put it, put it on because... Uh, that's a gift from so-and-so and then takes a picture of him. So number one, he changes his clothes. Number two, they get a picture of him in those clothes that day in case there was a wandering issue. Absolutely brilliant. Never heard anything like it before. The uh, the other thing, uh, and in here I see in chat, we've got Deborah who says, Tracy, thanks to your book, I installed door locks so my husband couldn't leave unexpectedly and he was, and I was finally able to sleep. Um, the um, uh, so uh, Deborah, thanks for sharing that. And um, uh, do you can you elaborate a little bit on what she might have read in the book regarding 
locks on doors? Oh, absolutely. Um, using, say, let's say key deadbolt locks. Uh, now, when somebody's got a, an urge to wander, they're not going to stop. They're just going to keep going until you take care of whatever that issue is, or you can find a way to prevent it. So what I had to do with my own dad, because he was literally Harry Houdini of escapism, and he could, he literally, for those of you that did not see the previous episode, uh, he was in the most secure care facility in our county. And he figured out how to unscrew the plate glass window, pull it out, climb out in his pajamas and slippers, put the plate glass window in and screw the screws back in so that nobody ever knew how he escaped. Um, most people can't do that. But for those people that are, are still gifted enough that they can, having a key deadbolt lock on the door will prevent them from being able to walk out the door. Also putting a hasp bar lock, um, the bar lock, they, it takes two hands to open it up. So you've got the metal part with the knob on the end, and then you've got the hasp that goes over it. And so when you pull it open, it prevents the door from opening. Really, it's supposed to protect you from people invading your home, but it also pre protects your loved one from trying to get out. So they can't do it unless they're really super strong, which there are people that are that strong that can rip them off. But unless you've, you know, they're super strong that you, they're not, they're just going to close the door and try another exit. It gives you time to uh, find them and prevent them from going. So it's it, just one of those things. Oh, I love it. Okay. Um, I'm going to duck behind the curtain here. And, uh, and, and, and what Tracy said, I, guys, I, I shared her recording from the last one and she said, Steve, I think today I'd like to focus on bathroom. Is that what you were mm -hmm. thinking? Okay. So, um, but, but anything and everything is open uh, and please participate. I'm going to duck behind the curtain. Tracy, you take it away and then feel free to take a few pause breaks and I'll let you know if there's anything that, uh, um, that uh, folks are chiming in on. Well, first of all, Deborah, I want to give you a shout out. When you talked about, when I was talking about telling somebody a uh, uh, re let's say re-recognizing the truth for them. And we called it compassionate fibbing. I have used that everywhere. So I just want to say thank you, first of all, for that. And I have been giving you credit for it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, just before we get started, what you see here on the screen is a healthy aged brain. This is anybody 55 and above on the left-hand side. On the right side of your screen, you are seeing a brain that is in moderate Alzheimer's disease. You'll see it's shrinking, it's developing holes. So what's happening with your loved one is the brain is starting to fill with fluid and they can't their stories can't cross the gap. And if you think about how we learn, the way we learn is we take the experience we have and we apply it to the new thing that we're learning. And so our brain automatically fills that gap in for us. Now that your loved one is going the opposite direction and they're getting holes in their brain, their brain is going to substitute something else. And that something else won't be anywhere close to what you guys might be talking about or what you're experiencing. So what we want to do is be able to get into their story and guide them to someplace where they'll be safe, where they feel loved and happy. So I just want to give this as a quick reference as we're working through what we're going to go the slides today. So first of all, I want to talk about the importance of color. Um, black looks like a hole. White is great for disguises and contrast. Red and blue, the, the bright colors that you're seeing on the screen right now, uh, will help you highlight items. And pastel is great for disguising things. And the reason is, as with Alzheimer's disease, they get a chromatopsia, which means they can see black, white, or bright colors. They can't necessarily see what the right colors are. And we want to use that to our advantage. So if somebody is going to be wandering, uh, if you put a black doormat in front of the door, uh, they'll see the hole. No one wants to fall in a hole and they will turn away from that. Mostly. I mean, that doesn't work for everybody. If they're not far enough along, it won't work. But the farther along they get in the dementia, it will look like a hole. Uh, remember that in low light, Navy blue and dark brown will also look like a hole. So just keep that in mind. Um, when we are looking at the bathroom, if you're having trouble getting people to bathe or to toilet, look around your bathroom and see what the bathroom looks like. Uh, are there bright colors? Uh, is Do you have black bath mats where they're afraid to go to the toilet? So, so let's put this to use here. I have a picture. 
This is a very, very lovely monochromatic bathroom. And you can already see there's not going to be enough contrast for them to see the tub or the toilet or the sink. So what we need to do is highlight it so that they can see what they're doing. So if you have like the white bathtub and you have a white shower chair, they're not going to be able to see where to sit down. They just, there won't be enough contrast. If you put a colored, brightly colored towel on that bath mat or bath, I mean, on that shower chair, they can find it to sit down on it. So it's going to uh, reduce the safety issues. You can also use colored toilet seats. So if they're having trouble seeing something and everything else is white around it, you can do a blue or a red toilet seat that they can see. So the other part to this is if it's, uh, again, too monochromatic or if there's glare. So you'll notice that there's a towel rod on the side there to, to warm towels. Um, if, if you've got too much glare coming off that, that can potentially cause hallucinations. So let's look at the bathroom. Where do you want to start? We want to create an environment that is uh, encouraging them to use the bathroom. So you want to put things in there that like you might put a rubber duck in there that looks like a bathroom. You don't want to have medical supplies sitting out where anyone can see them. Um, look at the flooring. Is it shiny? Is it waxed? Is it uh, check patterned? Check patterns can also cause hallucinations. Do the tiles or the flooring go up onto the wall because then they might not be able to perceive that that's not a place to walk or a step. All right. Cover the mirrors. If they are in moderate Alzheimer's disease, they may not recognize themselves. And we're going to talk about mirrors in a few minutes. But the things that you can do with mirrors uh, will we'll also cover um, daylight lighting. Now, it's as we get older, our the lenses thicken in our eyes, our eyes yellow just a little bit, and you can't always see. And it's easier when you have brighter light to see and read. Uh, well, the same thing is going to work in the bathroom, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be comfortable for everybody else in the family that's in the home. So if you can put it on a dimmer switch, then when everybody else goes in there, they're not going, oh dear God, I can't see, it's too bright. So um, you just want to think about the rest of the family's comfort level too when you're looking at making any changes. Also removing clutter. I like this picture because it is so over the top, but you can't see anything on that counter to find it aside from the fact that it's completely disaster and it's falling apart. But this is how somebody with dementia is going to perceive a bunch of stuff on the counter. They can't see it. Uh, a lot of times people with Alzheimer's disease rummage. So if you have the area cleared of stuff and you only have out the things that you need because they can mistake uh, bathroom cleaners for hairspray or they can mistake like uh, hemorrhoid cream for toothpaste. So you just don't want to have things out that they can accidentally get into that will make them ill. Um, another thing to think about is temperature. And the reason I stress temperature is because the first night my dad was living with us, it was three days after Christmas. It was 34 degrees outside. My home was 67 degrees. My dad had just, we had gotten him released from a care facility where it was 80 degrees. And I did not know enough about hypothermia to understand how quickly somebody could go hypothermic. We had to call the fire department to have them come in to tell me because I had checked his blood pressure. I had checked his blood sugar. I never thought to check his temperature. And even though he was dressed in warm clothing, it wasn't enough. So it was, it's just something to keep in mind because when you're bathing, somebody can get cold, cold very quickly once they get out of the warm water. Okay. So we just talked about different things you can see here. So I'm going to ask, pause right now. Anybody have any questions? Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you took that little pause because Susan asks, does this apply to dementia that is not diagnosed as Alzheimer's? And one of the things um, uh, that I was going to say, Susan, is a lot of Tracy's tips are wonderful tips uh, for all of us. Um, uh, and some do like, you know, the mirrors obviously are direct dementia related, but the toilet seats and things like that for just somebody, it, they could have no cognitive impairment and they just have macular degeneration or cataracts or some vision issues. So uh, um, what are your thoughts on that, uh, on, on some of the things that you're suggesting uh, for, for people not diagnosed with dementia? 
Oh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, uh, definitely with macular degeneration or somebody with low vision, uh, having enough color contrast is really helpful. Um, but you'll also notice a lot across the spectrum, the dementia spectrums, that a lot of these things will not be just specific to Alzheimer's disease, but will be specific, will, will work with other dementias. So the thing is, you have to design this to go with whatever you notice your loved one is doing. Watch their body language when you take them into the bathroom. What are Where are you getting resistance? Is it coming from something that you personally are doing, like you're in a hurry? Or is it something where they can't see? And are they to the point where they can no longer articulate what's going on? So uh, if somebody has Parkinson's or Lewy body, uh, or perhaps they have... Um, FTD, what, whatever the, the, the issue is, it depends on where they are in their dementia, how they're going to react to it. So um, it's up to you to kind of be the detective and see how they react. Their body language will give you a good idea. Also their words, whatever words they can give you. Um, but there's also the, the vision apps, access, uh, aspect as well as sound. Now, it could be there could be a noise in there that they're hearing and that it's bothering them. And I hadn't talked about sound yet, but if there's echoing, if there is any type of buzzing, if there is like a fan going and you don't hear it because you can tune it out, but maybe it has a little rattle in it because it's getting old and the, the ball bearings are going out. Uh, any of these things can upset someone who has cognitive decline because they can't process it the way you and I do. So does that answer your question? Um, I think so. But Susan, jump in for more dialogue. So uh, keep on going, Tracy. This is great. Okay. So um, now that we're looking at this, we can talk about hallucinations for just a second. Um, hallucinations, when you have a loved one that is having a hallucination, take the time to walk them through to a place of safety. Admit to them that you can't see whatever it is that's going on with them, but for them, it is extremely real. If you remember, I talked about the holes in the brain, their brain is filling in this image for them that they are seeing that you cannot. So walking them through, uh, admitting that you can't see it, ask them if they want to leave the area, try walking them out because a lot of times that will remove whatever is causing the issue as removing them from the location, uh, getting them something warm to drink, wrapping them in a warm or weighted blanket, anything you can do to create a sense of safety, uh, putting on music. If they're screaming, yelling, or crying, then you need to become their champion, get them out of that room. Uh, if they aren't calming down, stand on their dominant side. So if they're right-handed on their right hand, if they're left-handed, stand on their left side, yell the same thing they are yelling with them. I learned this from Tipa Snow. It's a great tip. They will stop yelling once you're yelling and become their champion. And then it's time to walk them through to a place of safety. So getting them to calm down. Now, I also talk about this in my book and it's available for the 10 steps to calming aggressive dementia behavior as a giveaway on my uh, email signup sheet. If you want to get a free copy of it, it's available. Um, so anything you can do to calm them down. Now, just because you've gotten them calm down doesn't mean that the hallucination won't recur. So it's kind of keeping an idea of what the triggers are. On my website, I also have on the resources page, the meltdown trigger list. It's got directions on it. You can write down the things that you notice about the environment and also uh, what your the behaviors going on, the noises, the sounds, the temperatures, all of those things that could be causing a problem. And after you've, uh, after you've observed this three or four times, you're going to start to get an idea of what the problem is so that you can change whatever that is, if it's lighting, uh, any of those things. So what are glare or, or, you know, the sunlight's coming at the wrong angle and they can't handle the, the sunlight or the shadows. So whatever it is, and then share that information once you've got it figured out with everybody else in the family so that everyone is prepared for that so that you you get some respite too. Okay, let's going on here. I already talked about removing and hiding supplies that could be confused for soap, shampoo, toothpaste, mouthwash. Um, also, what kind of faucets do you have on the tub or the sink? Is it something that they can manipulate? Is it a lever or a twist turn or a pull? Uh, if they have arthritis, can they still use the knobs? Okay. Are, do they turn in the proper direction? Sometimes uh, manufacturers supply universal 
adapter kits. If you haven't turned it to the correct direction, it's okay for you to know that you can turn the cold water going backwards instead of forwards on a pull lever where that maybe your loved one won't. So we don't want to end up having somebody get scald or injured or frozen. So, and are they labeled correctly for hot and cold? I've been in many places where I've seen the labels have been reversed and the person that lives there, it's not a problem for them, but for the person with dementia, that could be. Okay. Is the water temperature on your hot water tank set above 120 degrees? As somebody progresses in their dementia, their ability to register heat and cold will diminish. And it's too easy for them to get burned if the water's too hot and they can't necessarily tell you. Uh, as you're starting to get to know them and with bathing, have uh, have them stick their hand in or put a little of the water on their wrist and see how they react. And they'll let you know if it's too hot or too cold. Uh, you can watch by their body language. So just to keep aware that, that it could be too hot, it could be too cold, because what you might enjoy, they might not. All right. Um, are there grab bars in your bathroom, around the tub, the toilet, and anywhere where they could slip or fall? Also, is there non-slip material? Because as we get older, or even those of us that aren't older, 25% of all injuries happen in the bathroom. So it's important that we don't, you know, that we put as much safety material in there as possible so that they can't slip or fall, especially if they get out of the tub and their feet are wet and there isn't someplace dry for them to step. Okay. Is the bathtub spout cushioned. It's the same thing like you would do for a child. You can get the uh, child safety material to put around it because again, it's falling and hitting their head. So anything you can do to prevent an injury is a plus. All righty. So what type of toilet handle do you have? I'm going to tell you right now, most people with dementia cannot use the two flush system successfully. If they have arthritis, they won't be able to use it at all because they won't have the strength in their hands to flush the toilet. It's better to use the flush, the single handle flush. So just keep that in mind when you're observing what your, your loved one is doing. All right. Is the toilet seat raised or is it a standard height? As we get older, it's a little harder to get up when the seat is lower. So if you can get a raised toilet seat, that would be very, very helpful. Now, next thing to talk about is if they're very, very short. Do they need a stool to put their feet on to comfortably go to the bathroom? Because the whole point is to keep them on the toilet long enough to do their business, not to have them being uncomfortable scrolling around and then running around and urinating as they're leaving the toilet. So anything you can do to improve their comfort and then keep them occupied. Uh, you can hand them something to read, kind of like you would do with a little kid when you're doing potty training. Give them a book to read, give them something to rummage through, maybe Legos to play with, well, but probably not Legos, but something to play with in their hands to, to keep their hands busy while they're at the toilet. Okay, so with bathing and toileting, let's look at these three options. Um, if you're having difficulty, and I'm gonna, oh, let me stop here for a moment. Steve, are there any questions before we go on? Um, uh, well, yeah. Um, can you just reiterate the uh, a two flush toilet um, lever? Is that, so I see the toilet there on, on the right. Uh, the race, is that a traditional two flush? That's, that's, it, it's not a two flush. That's a, a, a single handle flush. The okay. two flush is usually a button at the top of the toilet tank. Ah, it'll it. have, it'll be divided in half. The small half is for the water. The, the large half is when you're flushing down feces. And, um, okay. And then, uh, Patrice says, my mother looks in the bathroom mirror and thinks the person she sees is a friend and talks to her. She will continue to say, I can't hear you if uh, when she asks a question. Any, um, and, and so I guess Patrice's story, thank you, Patrice, for sharing that, is really an illustration about how customized this is to each of our loved ones. Oh, absolutely. And I actually have a little thing we're going to talk about for 
uh, mirrors here in just a moment, but I want to address this right now. Okay. If your mother is talking to her friend in the mirror and she's not getting upset other than a little frustrated, she can't hear, then let her do it. She's actually engaging with somebody and you want her to be able to engage. And, and it's somebody that she feels cares for her. So if it was something where she's getting upset about a stranger, which is what I'll address here in a few minutes, um, then that's when we need to talk about disguising mirrors. So we'll talk about that and I'll show you some ideas here in just a few seconds. But Excellent. any right. other questions? Nope. Keep on going. This is okay. Great. So if you cannot get your loved one to go in and bathe in the bathtub shower area or whatever you have, there is a there are sits baths available. There's videos online that can show you how to use them. I've got a, an example of a sits bath here on the left. And you can literally put in things like uh, with the water with a little bit of perhaps Epsom salts or witch hazel or, or something in there just to keep it uh, sanitary so that they don't get infection. Because one of the things we want to prevent is them getting skin infections. Uh, sometimes people have a fear of water getting in their face. My own father was terrified of the water uh, getting in his face. He's okay showering. He just didn't want to have it in his face. So we had to get an adaptive shower head that he could uh, move down because he didn't want to, we didn't want him with the handheld showers because he would spray everywhere. So we got an adaptive shower head where he could lower it down to the level that was comfortable for him and he could bathe. So you have to look at what your loved one is doing and then kind of get an idea and as, encourage them as they can do things on their own for as long as they can. You'll know when they can't. And then that's it. And when they start showing those symptoms, then transition them to something else. But in, in this case, also, if that you can't get them to wipe, there are bidet options. The one I'm showing here is a heated bidet. So you can attach it to your toilet. It will rinse your loved one. So then you don't have to worry about making them sit there longer to get them to wipe because sometimes that can be an issue. Um, also, the raised toilet seats with handles are very, very helpful. Uh, there's also a uh, liners that you can get to prevent the urine and feces from going out of the toilet. Uh, they're available at your local uh, pharmacy or you know store to get the, uh, to line the toilet because you don't want to have to clean up two messes. It's, it's, you're going to have enough stuff to clean up. Anything you can do to make it simple is best. Okay. Any questions on that? Nope. We're good. Keep on going. Okay. So here's our mirrors. Okay. Most of us, when we're looking in the mirror, this we see ourselves. Okay. Now, when someone we love is looking in the mirror, they could see they, in their mind, they're perceiving whatever age they think they're at. Um, so they might think that they are 29 years old. And so they see the person in the mirror. But what they're really seeing, if you see the woman in the background there, that is them looking back at themselves. And so it could be they're getting very upset because they don't recognize that person and think it's a stranger. Or if they think it's their mom or their aunt or somebody else, if it's something where they're not getting upset and they're comfortable, let them do it. You want to keep them engaged. So, but if they are getting upset, let's talk about some ways you can cover the mirror to get them to go into the bathroom. And you'll also, when they're at that point, you also want to remove mirrors from all the common areas in the house so that they, you don't have something happen when you're walking down a hall and there's a mirror there and they suddenly melt down when you're trying to get them to go to eat. So if you're working on a budget, you can use uh, cordless shades. They could be cellular or the roller style um, so that before they go in to go bathe, you literally just pull it down over the mirror and voila, no mirror. It's a covered window. All right. Uh, you can also do short window curtains over it so you can get just an inexpensive rod and then slide the curtains over it so that it's also covered. Again, it looks like a, a window instead of a mirror. Uh, you can do sh the same thing with shower curtains. You just you know, have to shorten the shower curtain. Um, if you don't have any of these and it's the first time your family member's melting down, wet paper towels work great in a pinch. You just wet them down, flap the sheets all over it until it's all covered, then bring them back in, voila, no mirror. So just some things to think about. But yeah, if they're talking to somebody and they're not getting upset, let them do it. Any questions here? No, what what a wonderful idea with the mirrors uh, and the shades. Uh, and again, as I told you all, a lot of Tracy's tips are from hardware stores and things of like that nature. But uh, Tracy, I do have somebody who is on they're they're on our LinkedIn stream listening to this. It's Rafaela, and I'm not sure what you said in one of the previous slides, but she said, "Do you think this can help with?" Uh, um, 
uh, uh, an older adult with dementia who is avoiding taking a shower. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what she's referencing, what you were talking about I um, specifically there, but do you have any tips on uh, helping somebody take a shower? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, we're going to get to that here in just a second. Um, so I just want to say just as far as mirrors are concerned, or even with bathing, just pay attention to body language. When your loved one can't communicate with you verbally, they can still communicate with their body language. Okay, so one other thing to consider trying to get your loved one to bathe is creating a calming space. So essential oils. Now I got this from uh, Alzheimer's and Dementias for Dummies. Uh, they were talking about using essential oils. You can also put these uh, into like little warmers so that they make the bathroom smell lovely. Or you, if they bathe. Now, some people are afraid of bathing. Other people want showers. Some people, it depends on, and we'll talk about this in a second, but it depends on how they bathed when they grew up. If you have a family member that grew up during the depression and they had 17 siblings and they were number 11 of 17 and they couldn't afford a lot of water and so they bathed in order and your mother is child number 11 she may never ever ever want to bathe in a bathtub again um, however she may be very fond of showers but if you're trying to get your loved one to bathe at a time that was not their natural time for bathing so let's say that you want to bathe them in the morning and they bathe naturally in the evening uh, you're going to have to switch to match whatever they did during their lifetime because we're trying to uh, use their routine to help them and the all all powerful words in dementia care is routine, routine, routine. We'll talk about that again here in a second. So, and I just thought the baby picture was so cute. I had to throw it in here. Um, so with bathing and distraction techniques and being their champion, routine, respect, patience is a virtue here and a smile. If you can get them smiling, if you can get them singing, let's talk about some things that we can do to make it easier to convince them to go bathe. Okay, always ask their permission before you do anything. It's so easy because you're exhausted to get caught up in the moment. You need to get to the next thing that you have to do and that you're in a hurry and you want to rush them through this. And then that's when all hell breaks loose. So always ask permission, always smile, and make sure that you also smile with your eyes because not only can we read body language, they can still read body language all the way up to the end. Okay. Offer to cover them if it's a modesty issue. Some people do not want to be seen naked by others. It could be from an emotional trauma from a childhood. It could just be that it's the air they grew up in and they're very modest. So you can either use like a warm bathrobe and bathe them under the bathrobe, use a towel. The Dignity Resource Council offers Dignity Wear, which is a dignity, uh, it's a terry cloth for men. It's a terry cloth uh, skirt for the bottom half. For women, it comes also with a, a top that you you can wash underneath. Um, it's all in Terry and it's wash machine washable. So it makes it easy to, to keep it clean. Um, also, if you're, uh, if this is your first time you're having this experience or you don't have a lot of money, take a twin sheet, fold it in half, cut a hole in it where you can slide it over their head so you can bathe them underneath it. It also helps to try and keep them warm. So anything you can do to understand that what it is that's causing the resistance, is it their modesty? Is it something else? Okay. Another thing is, if you're using a, sh a bathing chair, a shower chair, consider getting a bath pillow that they can sit on and lean back on so that they can relax. Um, it's The more you can get them relaxed to lean back and take that bath, you can then, if you are helping them, ask if it's okay, show them what you're doing, put a little bit of, of cleanser on the a wet washcloth, and start with their hand, start washing their hand and working your way up their arm. It's all baby steps, but just trying to guide them through to find out where they're uncomfortable and make sure that they're okay with what you're doing. All right. Next, you can also, and this works great for both men and women, is putting a warm washcloth on their face and just have them lean back in the uh, shower chair with the, the bath pillow and put the warm rag over their face. It keeps them warm. Then they won't see what you're doing, but you still talk to them and uh, they and keep you know, cut the conversation going, even if it's one-sided, just so that you can guide them through what you're doing next. Um, it also doesn't hurt to bribe them. Perhaps they like have a sweet tooth and they want to have that uh, strawberry milkshake after they have their bath or shower or whatever it is. So it doesn't hurt and don't feel bad about it because trust me, no one from that has dementia dies overweight. 
Okay. You can also suggest a lady or gentleman caller is coming and they might want to freshen up. Look at them and what they were like in their lifetime. Decide what works best for them. Or you can do one of the fun things that one of my friends and I did for her mom. We created spa coupons and we turned her bathroom into a little spa. We had a little sign-in book so that she could sign in. We put the bath oils out. We had a little bit of her favorite music going. And so she thought we were going to the spa, even though we would just walk down the hall. So you just never know. And then also, this is a good tip for women, uh, baby dolls. They can wash the baby doll while you're washing them and then they're occupied. If now, this is the caveat, if a body part falls off while they're washing it, you're going to get a cataclysmic meltdown and they're going to want you to call 911. Do not ignore it. Put the body part back in, pat it, kiss it till it's it's all healthy again and give it back to your, your family member um, because you want them to stay calm and have a good experience. Okay. Any questions here? No, but I, I, I hope Rafaela on LinkedIn heard those, uh, those bathing tips and, and hopefully that helped you with some solutions that you might be able to help with that person who's having difficulty taking a shower. Now, Jeanette, I, this may or may not tie into uh, what you've said or what comes up, but she says, what if you had a client that absolutely will not allow a caregiver to provide any personal care? She won't even entertain the offer. Um, any any ideas um, on 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 that for Jeanette? Oh, absolutely. Okay, uh, I'm assuming that it's a paid caregiver, and they're coming in in scrubs or some other where they're looking medical. Pro- Probably. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to have that person come in as a friend. They're not going to be in their scrubs. They're going to be in street clothes. They're going to come in and be introduced and sit and chat. And I realize that's not what they're being paid to do, but you need to gain the confidence of the person that you're working with. So coming in as a friend, somebody that's not going to force them to do something they don't want to do. um, After you've gotten to know that person, then they're going to be more receptive to you suggesting, hey, while I'm here, can I help you with an X, Y, or Z? So you have to it's just like creating friends. You just have to bridge that barrier. And then if, if you're allowed to take that time to do that, you'll find it much easier to get along with them because they will trust you right now. They don't trust you. You're a stranger and it's stranger danger. So consider that when, when you're sending someone in um, after you've had a meeting with the family, find out uh, how, uh, how receptive the person might be. Cause uh, my aunt had a woman that came in to bathe her and my, we had not signed up for bathing and I wasn't there. And she tried to force my aunt to bathe. And my aunt was a very, very feisty woman and told her she could put it where the sun doesn't shine. Fortunately, my sister and her husband were there and they escorted the woman out. Well, it turns out the woman wasn't even a bathing assistant. She was um, a speech pathologist and she was covering for someone and just needed to get to her next appointment and, and, wanted to argue about it and just get it done. So these things can happen. So it also depends on, you know, the approach, Uh, come in with a smile on your face, introduce yourself, you know, tell a funny story, just something so that you can get them to lower that barrier so that they will trust you. Did that answer your question? And, and, you know, I think I love your storytelling and your ideas, Tracy, because it just, it helps inspire us to get out out of the box. And Jeanette, hopefully some that suggestion and others are helpful. And Jeanette had mentioned that that their team oftentimes wears regular street clothes. So that's a, a great practice for folks out there who are in the home care space. Um, <laughs> uh, I got to read Adele's uh, uh, shower story here. She says, one funny story. My mom's caregiver would shower with her so she wasn't scared or felt alone. Now, obviously, this is this is customized to the needs of the person we're caring for. Um, but if that works, it's um, an opportunity to to make it work. Well, and I have an addendum to that. Um, if you're having you, let let's say that somebody got kicked out because the the loved one just didn't trust them or for whatever reason. You can go out, change your shirt, put on a hat, come back in, you're a different person, and then just approach it differently. Mm -hmm. So it's just just 
kind of thinking outside the box, what can you do to help this person? Because you're there to be their champion. You're not there to uh, rodeo them in t- and, and rope them and tie them up and throw them in the corner. It, that we're not going for the eight seconds. So we're, we, what we're trying to do is we are helping somebody that's lost at sea, that has no hope of ever getting to land again. And we want to help them feel safe on that journey. Great. And uh, J- Jeanette loves that suggestion of changing clothes. And um, uh, the, so that that's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, Lori says here, my mother-in-law just accepted shower assistance from a caregiver for the first time last week. Congrats. Although, Congratulations. Although she was really resistant, afterwards, she called my husband and said how wonderful the helper was and that she felt squeaky clean something she would have said 60 years ago to her kids. And, and, you know, Tracy brought this up is, is that um, is meeting your loved one at the age and place in life that they are. And now you've got this little clue of where her, her frame of reference is, and you can build a lot of things around that. Can't you, Tracy? Oh, absolutely. Um, One of the things is, and I talked about this on the other video, is creating a memory book for them that tells their story. That way you can find more quickly how, where they are in their timeline and you can address the issues, including if they're melting down or they're saying they have to go home or they're trying to wander, whatever the trigger is, you'll now have kind of a frame of reference to know where they were in their timeline. So you can tailor your answers to meet their expectations. So if they're telling you that their husband is, uh, where's her husband, where's her husband? And then you say, oh, Joe is uh, at the bar. And, and she goes, yeah, well, he's a louse. Of course he's at the bar. So then you believe that. Or if you tell him he's working late and that he's got this project he's doing, and then it was something where he was actually a contractor, then that's not going to fly. So uh, you just want to make sure you tailor it to whatever her life experiences were. Um, You might get stories out of that that you can't repeat. You might get stories that hurt your feelings, but you also might hear a a recovered memory that's a wonderful story too that comes along with that. So you never know what you're going to get when you start tailoring things to where they are in their timeline. Anything else? Okay, then. One of the things that is the most powerful, and I cannot stress this enough, is singing and music. It is the last thing to go. Um, If you can get them singing, they're usually in a happy place. If you know the music that they listen to in their teens and 20s, that's the music to go for. Uh, Or if they were uh, very, very heavily going to church and they sang in the church choir, uh, those are the things that you want to uh, sing with them. And the both of you singing together, that usually takes them back down to calm. Also playing their favorite music while they're bathing is another technique to help them calm down. Uh, Never underestimate the power of music uh, and and its ability to calm. Also think about, uh, let's go back to the bathroom for a second. If you're living in a home and it has a gigantic bathroom, the the large space may be too overwhelming for your loved one. And you'll need to break the space down and make it smaller because for somebody with dementia, doesn't matter which type, the smaller spaces feel safer. You don't get a lot of echo. You don't get a lot of sound working around. So what you can do in that instance is get a cubicle rod and you're going to use shower curtains and you're going to make the space smaller with a shower curtain. Um, It'll just make it a little bit easier. They'll feel safer. You'll have a little less resistance from your loved one. Okay, now the don'ts. Do not use bath pearls. They look like candies to somebody with an impaired uh, memory, and they can eat or swallow them. Do not use a whirlpool or jetted tub because the bubbles look like the water is boiling. Also, do not leave them in the bathtub alone because, as most of us know, it only takes two inches of water for them to drown. You could be running down the hall to answer the phone, and they could slip or see something that's really interesting and fall face first into the water. Okay. Also, something we don't think about is the older we get, our skin gets thinner. And so when somebody is uh, over the age of 70 and their skin starts to thin, you want to pat their skin dry and not rub it because you don't want to create skin ulcers or open wounds. So those are things to think about. Now, do we have any other questions? 
Um, I think we are good, uh, okay. but yep. Okay, so uh, instead of talking about my stuff, I want to talk about other impressive works out there. I've added more things to my list from those of you who have seen it the last time. Um, I want to make sure that you guys know about Paula Spencer Scott's book, Surviving Alzheimer's. It is a really phenomenal book. I have this book. I don't know if you see me in the corner. Whoops, let me get this back here. I love it so much. I have tabs on every single page I want to flip to. Okay. Um, the End of Alzheimer's, the first program to reverse and prevent cognitive decline. I love this book. It really is helpful for people that, but you have to stick to it. You cannot, it's not something where you can start it and then it just goes away. It just, it, it can slow it down or reverse it depending on where the person is. Also, The End of Alzheimer's Program, also by Dr. Dale Bredesen. This one is a little more comprehensive on the steps you need to take with less of the science in it. Um, and I can't, you can't see my 36 hour day, perhaps, I don't know where you're, you're stuff is on there, but the 36 hour day is the Bible of dementia care. It covers every aspect of dementia care. If it's, if you can only afford one book, that's the book to get. All right. Oop. And my, there we go. Learning to speak Alzheimer's. This book is a fabulous book. It's older, um, but it helps you with looking at the designs inside your home and how to make your home more safe. And she does a great job of giving you all sorts of tips with also bathing and just affirming the person to get them to be cooperative. Um, again, I love this book also, The Caregiver's Guide to Dementia by Gail Wetherill. Um, it's a really short, quick read. It has little snippets in it of different activities to do, different mindsets, um, how to do self-care. Just a, a wonderful, wonderful book. And Creating Moments of Joy Along the Alzheimer's Journey is my absolute all-time favorite. Uh, this one saved my bacon. It was the first one I really got a lot of how-to answers out of it. So I, I recommend this one highly. And then the last one, I, all of us are starting to recognize that because of the isolation we had in COVID, we understand that isolation that we get with dementia care. People don't understand how to, how to deal with somebody with dementia and they withdraw and you're going to see your friends withdrawing, family members walking away. Um, this book, Share the Care, is a really great way of teaching people how to help their time has value, that they don't always have to interact with the person, but they could do something to help you around the house. It's a great support system. And the benefit of this is that once your loved one passes, you now have a support network that will be there for you for the rest of your life. So are there any other questions? Wow. Okay. Well, these are amazing. And the um, resources, and this is Another thing I love about uh, Tracy, you're so transparent in terms of where you've found inspiration and gained your knowledge. The um, is uh, are 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 these books? I, I looked under resources and I didn't see you referencing the books on the resources page of your website. Oh no, I only list them in my actual book. Okay, um, all right. But that's a really great suggestion. I will have to put that on there. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. because that would be great and and in the interim I'll be able to uh, I'll be able to add these onto the recording site but the um but um Nicole says she she had a question on your thoughts about the um the Dr. Bresden book and and you know the title I think and book titles are very catchy oftentimes it's it's publishers that are the ones coming up with this but the end of Alzheimer's and she says do, do the elements in that book book really work? Because, you know, there is no real cure yet. And I'm glad you asked that question. That's a really great question. Um, I accidentally reversed my dad's Alzheimer's disease for three years because of the information in that book. I didn't realize that's what I was doing. I was just trying to do anything I could to uh, make him feel better. But then I also uh, need to let everybody know that, when I re uh, recovered my dad from being institutionalized and got him home to live with us, he was on 38 different medications. 22 of them were to make him compliant and they were having negative drug interaction effects. So I took uh, his med list to the pharmacy, had them uh, 
put a report together for me that I could take to his primary care physician. And we took him off those 22 medications. And then I started, uh, we started working on his diet, the exercise, the socializing. Eventually we got to the point where he could actually go for walks by himself and not get lost and come back and tell me about how his day was. Uh, He still had a little bit of sundowning in the evening, but it was nothing like it had been. But it only lasted until he decided that he wasn't getting to live anymore, that the diet was too restrictive. And the minute we went off of the program, he declined rapidly. So it it, it ha- offers hope. I can't say it's a cure-all, but it it can turn things back. Or if you're early on, there's a possibility it can prevent. Um, I can't make guarantees. Everybody is different, but it's not. it's worth a try to know that it's out there. I, I love it. And um, here, uh, uh, okay, so um, yeah, just uh, b- everybody is really complimentary as I knew they would be of your your discussion today. And I want to let folks know, I mean, think if you're if you're part of a, a trade association, if you've got a big conference or even you know you've got a group that would like a, a speaker um, because Tracy is, you're currently not caregiving, correct? Correct. My my last loved one just passed. So she is available and I highly endorse her and recommend her. So feel I'll, I'm making sure to drop your contact information into, um, into, because folks can have you as their speaker. The other, the other thing is, is that Tracy, I believe you will, you're in Washington state, but yes. you will, um, brainstorm with people and work on mm-hmm. w- with phone consultations as well. Yes. And let me give you my next slide here. Um, okay. That has my contact information. Uh, it's got my email address on there. Feel free to email me. And then we can talk and uh, set up a time for a phone consultation if that's what you'd like to do. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I, I do have a day job, so I may not be able to respond right away, but I will get back to you. Out of curiosity, what is your day job? Oh, I'm a manufacturer's rep in the electrical industry. So uh, (laughs) it has nothing to do with this. (laughs) It gets better and better every time I talk with you. This is, uh, I mean, how wonderful you're making time to do this. And uh, Missy, yes, we'll have the the video link just in a few hours. It'll be on our website at proaging.com. We'll have it on... uh, podcast so folks can listen to it while they walk their dogs. Um, Maggie asks, how do you convince your father? How did you convince your father to start socializing? My mom refuses to be in social situations, which is a lot of pressure on me because it makes me the activities director. Ah, okay. So it first has to start in the home and you can't have more than two people visiting, but If you have one to two people coming into your home to visit and then you have an activity, whether it's looking at a memory book, uh, having photo albums. Uh, I talked about Legos earlier. Um, I I don't know if you're familiar with Loretta Vaney. I I know Steve knows her. Oh, Um, yeah. I just had her on my podcast, which I have a picture of in the corner of the, the slide here. Um, she is, And it was this morning, by the way. Um, she is a phenomenal speaker and teaches Lego Serious Play, which is a great way of connecting with people. If somebody's really far into dementia, you can use the Duplo box. But for somebody that doesn't have words, they can express the way they feel using the Legos. So you can say, what does joy look like? And they can make joy. And then you have a a thing you can all do together. The same thing could work with crayons and, you know, having large, uh, you might see the coloring books with the large images on them. Do not do something that has a lot of intricacy to it, but with large images so that they can color. We got my aunt to do that. Um, And she, she was actually very excited to be creative at the end of her life when she hadn't been able to be creative for a while. So um, there's different things that you can do to invite them in, uh, have a little bit of socializing. Uh, You could even, you know, make collage. You can just, you know, anything that's finger oriented, touchy, uh, sort, uh, it depends on the person. I mean, some people, if they're too far along, it, it, it's going to be more difficult, but singing together, my dad and I also did, um, nursery rhymes and his favorite one. And some people are going to find this kind of, I, I get to read when I talk about this. So I'll tell you right away. Uh, excuse me. I'll tell you the rhyme right now. It's wire, briar, limberlock, three geese in a flock. One flew East, one flew West, 
one flew over the cuckoo's nest. He and I would say that together. Now, that's also the name of a movie because it's part of a counting rhyme that's been around for hundreds of years. But it was something that he could remember and he could say. And we would also sing things like uh, Pop Goes the Weasel. And I think I mentioned this before in the other video. Uh, he couldn't remember the words to Pop Goes the Weasel. So he changed the words and it became Poop Goes the Noodle. And we would <laughs> sing that and we would laugh every time. <laughs> so wow. do whatever gives you joy. You want to yeah. make it fun and give yourself permission to have fun. Give yourself permission to be present in that moment because you won't get that moment back. So anything you can do to create a memory for yourself as well, and to give yourself permission to slow down and cherish that moment because really funny things are going to happen. And if you don't give yourself permission to enjoy it, you're going to miss that moment. Mm. This is great. Um, Susan asks, can you describe sundowning? Um, You had mentioned it earlier. Oh, sure. Okay. So it's a worsening of behaviors in the evening. So uh, like my dad would wander around the house and, and just talk out loud to himself. And then he would move stuff around. Um, one of my family friends uh, walked around the house and uh, her mom would pick up the remote because she would see her daughter cooking dinner and she'd pick up the TV remote and she would bang it on all the furniture. And it took a while for us to figure out after, well, it took a little while to figure it out actually, because uh, she was going through remotes and going crazy because the remotes would keep breaking. But um, we figured out that she needed a job to do. And that's when I was showing her about using the apron, putting on the apron and then giving her a task. Well, all we had her do was we gave her uh, cloth napkins and we had her fold them and unfold them. And she was happy to do that until dinner was ready. So she just needed a, a the apron was her, told her she was on a job. And then the job was whatever was suited to her skill level at that time. And it doesn't matter if she does it 5,000 times, if it's keeping her active and giving her joy, then it prevents her from going around and melting down and screaming or telling you she wants to go home or that she has to go to work or whatever it is that is driving that moment. She knows she's supposed to be doing something because she sees you doing something. You're trying to cook dinner and you're getting frustrated because she's or he are doing these crazy behaviors. It could be they're opening and closing the drapes. It could be they're rummaging through all the drawers. Uh, it, it could be they're opening closets, taking everything out, and then just shoving it back in. Uh, it could be hoarding behavior. There's a lot of different behaviors. Uh, with hoarding, you just have to watch with the food. It's best to not get rid of the collections, but to thin them, and to thin them when they are not in the room. Uh, but you want them to be able to see it because it doesn't take away the emotional need if you get rid of everything. It, the emotional need will continue and you'll get catastrophic meltdowns. So uh, kind of embrace the fact that they're hoarding, but help them with their collections. You can also put them into clear plastic bins so that they can see them and they can rummage through them and then you can get them back into the labeled bin. Mm. Oh, wow. That's great. And yeah. And I mean, you know, it's one of these things where if your loved one has dementia and they are a hoarder, quote unquote hoarder, you know, it's beyond treating that the way that we would treat a hoarder mm -hmm. um, when when uh, you are cognitively there. And so managing it and thinning it out, what a great suggestion. Um, you know, Cindy uh, has a comment that I think really, again, also reiterates that every one of us is different. And she says that sundowning can happen at any time. Mm -hmm. My mom hit the wall around 3 p.m. And yeah, 3 to 8 p.m. seems to be the window for, for sundowning. My dad, 3 o'clock on the nose every single day. Great. Man, I glanced at the clock. I can't believe, of course, we've gone over an hour and I didn't even know oh, it. Sorry. Um, that's okay. No, we don't have a hard stop. Um the, uh, the, but, but I usually tell people, Hey, this is recorded and we're going to go a little bit long, but you can jump off. And then, um, Marianne says one theory of sundowning is that toward the late afternoon, whether we were working and had to close out work or parents and kids are coming home, they must get homework or dinner going. And now as the sun begins to go down, the sense of anxiety and needing to do things Wow, that, you know, that's a really, that makes a lot of sense, Marianne. Um, uh, I, I didn't think about it that way, but that makes a lot of sense, especially when we think about 
the brain with with uh, some form of dementia. Um, well, and yeah. and to add to that, um, you can also turn up the lights in your house if you have them on dimmer switches when it start the sun's starting to go down to help mitigate that. And also using uh, shades to block the, the to change the way the lighting is coming in so that it's a more even light so they don't necessarily get that urge. Great. And um, uh, per, per Shotton says, it's an amazing discussion, had lots of questions and experiences to share. Listening was more important, better next time. Um, and Per Shotton, you know, feel free to reach out and, and anybody there, feel free to reach out to Tracy. And, you know, like she said, if her time is permitting and, and you need somebody, you know, on your team that's really creative at brainstorming, I, I, think it would be absolutely wonderful to have Tracy uh, helping you out. So uh, Tracy, this is um, been, a, a, again, another just absolutely amazing discussion. Um, I, I'm going to pull out my calendar and get you back on because uh, you're one of my favorite people. <laughs> I just feel so positive talking about such a challenging uh transition that many of us may go through and um I, your demeanor is just it's just amazing i just always like talking with you so um thank you uh, steve so folks i'm gonna we'll get that get get everything up there and trace if if, if there's anything additional that you want me to add to your recording link, I'll just shoot it over via email and I'll get that to you. I, I do want to hear, I'm going to rob the screen real quick because, you know, when you, you talked about taking someone off medications, mm -hmm. um, th this, um, we've got this discussion. I, I cannot wait to have this discussion with everybody this woman reached out to me. She was on one of our discussions. Her um, uh, her, her name is um, uh, oh, Ginger, and uh, she uh, Ginger Smith. And basically, she was bedridden in a nursing home for two years. She showed signs of aphasia, Lewy body dementia, and more. They put her on hospice, and when they put her on hospice. They took her off all of her medications. Yep. She is living independently at home now in a condo, in an apartment complex, a few doors down from her adult son. She's articulate. She's happy. And she's going to be sharing that story. So it doesn't happen all the time, but, but what, what a story she, she's on death's door on hospice. So they take her off meds and now she's living independently. That is a fantastic story. Yeah, here, I'm going to drop that in there. But um, but uh, it doesn't work for everybody, you know, but as you'd said, taking your dad off of the meds, it, it helped turn things around too. Well, I can't suggest strongly enough that you have your loved ones med do a med check with the pharmacist. They're, they're the ones that are the specialist in it, and then they can give you a report you can take back to your physician. I love it. All right. Well, uh, Tracy, thanks again. And I see Patrice, this made conversation made my day, made my day too. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you again, Tracy, and keep up the great work, really. Thank you. Thank you very much.